Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's session with Lisa Saremi. My name is Jesse, and I'm on the Access Elite team that has brought this event to you today. For those of you who have logged on to one of our events before, welcome back. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Access Elite is a health and wellness company that provides on demand wellness content, same day prescription delivery, and facilitates live virtual events such as these, as well as much more. We at Access Lee are so happy to facilitate this event and bring a little bit of positivity and connection to your day. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest today. Lisa is a transformational coach, marriage and family therapist, and yoga therapist. And with that, Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone. And um, it's so exciting to be here with you in 2021. We spent uh, the last kind of four weeks going over goal setting and um, manifesting our visions. And uh, I'm excited to go into a four week series with you now on self-care. Because with all of that excitement of a vision and energy of wanting to go after that vision, we wanna make sure that we're doing it in a way that we can, um, can be, it can be sustained. And that goes with any big exciting thing we might be taking on because uh, a lot of times it can come with stress. So without further ado, let's just dive into our self-care series. So I call it sacred self-care and we'll dive into a little bit around like why. Um, and today, some of, um, some of us have gone over some of these concepts on some levels in the past, if you've been joining um, in the past webinars that uh, we've done with Access Elite. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about burnout, very high level conversation on the burnout, and then also compassion fatigue because they're, they um, are similar, but they're actually very different. And depending on the world we live in and the things that uh, encompass our lives can, um, can put us into one of those categories or the other. Then we're gonna kind of dive into the different layers that make up our wholeness and our entire being. The autonomic nervous system, uh, a little talk on polyvagal theory, which this all kind of brings us to the answer of what is sacred self-care. And then we'll work with a stress hack um, and a takeaway and open up for any questions. So we're starting with uh, just the distinction of burnout and then a comparison to something called compassion fatigue. They have very similar symptoms. They don't work within the same timeline, actually. Burnout happens over a little bit of a longer period of time. Compassion fatigue can happen pretty quickly. Um, burnout really it's it's not just an occupation it could be something that gets us really excited and a lot of times that can be in relationship to our careers so we pour all of ourselves in and then we start to get tunnel focused and we lose motivation over time because we've over poured ourselves into something it's overworking it's occupational stress and burnout happens when we are not using some type of a self-care plan to manage our stress along the way. Now, compassion fatigue is slightly different. Compassion fatigue can happen more likely in occupations where we might be dealing with trauma, right? So if you're in the realm of medicine, healthcare, um, or maybe a firefighter, anywhere where you might be exposed to trauma, even as a therapist, right, we can get exposed to trauma, secondary trauma. And what happens is over time, typically people that experience compassion fatigue are more in a caretaking role. They're in an environment where there might be a lot of uh, crisis or long, really stressful hours. And like I said before, a lot of trauma and just that witnessing of another going through that. So with compassion fatigue, the source is different. And it's really um, when we're in a position, so whether we're a caretaker for a family member, or maybe we're in a field 
that requires us to be in that secondary trauma exposure, um, it can really affect us in a lot of similar ways that burnout do. It's just, this can happen a lot faster because it's so tasking, taxing on us. So what are the symptoms when we get burnt out or when we have compassion fatigue? We might start to feel hopeless, depressed, anxious, really present to high levels of stress. Like we're not really ever finding a way to take that extra inhale and exhale. And then this combination of being really tired and really wired, right? We might not be sleeping um, because our minds, our busy minds are running so hard. So we did a whole series with stress. I know it's in Access Elite's library. You know, stress really impacts our body in a very inflammatory way. It doesn't let any one of our systems get away. It affects our minds, our skin, our hearts, our joints, our muscles, our gut, our reproductive system, our immune systems, because a lot of the hormones that get released. And because when we're in stress, we kind of need those hormones to keep pumping through our bodies. And when we're in chronic stress, which is what leads us to burnout, we end up in a place where we start to rob other parts of our system, right? To produce those hormones like cortisol to keep going. And so our whole being, just taking a moment to really acknowledge that, yes, we have these physical bodies. And there's a lot of things that might create stress on our bodies, right? When, we're, when we did the burnout series, we talked about how when we're under high levels of stress, a lot of times what happens is all of these different layers that make up our whole get ignored. So maybe you're already taking good care of yourself in the way that you eat and the way that you move your body, or maybe you're not, but I want you to know that that also creates stress, right? And that one's on in the body and the physical layer, the types of foods we eat, um, anything that has to do with our physicality and even over-exercise, right? If you're on the other side of the camp where you're just like overdoing it all the time with the body. And then there's the mind, right? The thoughts that we hold can really create stress in the body because they can create worry. They can get our heart rate beating and all those things that we just looked at in the previous slide. Um, and also our minds, we have consciousness. We can influence where our minds go. We can actually direct our minds and we can use those thoughts as a way to help us manage ourselves, uh, manage the stress, manage the self-care. And within um, body mind, I just wanna throw that there's an emotional layer there too. There's an emotional layer where we feel things, right? And when we're feeling things that don't feel good, like anger, sadness, those types of feelings create stress in our, in our physical bodies. And you see, these are all overlap. So it's really hard to peel the layers of our being apart. A lot of the work I do is really about how do we integrate these different layers so that there's a sweet spot right there in the middle where we're in our heart's consciousness. And um, spirit and soul, uh, when, I, when I speak to spirit and soul, I, what I'm speaking about is just that, that part of us that we can't really touch and feel, that part of us that makes meaning and that either feels our connect the connection that we are to something bigger and to each other or may feel misaligned with that. And that can create stress and all the other layers if it's present. So our autonomic nervous system, our nervous system has different parts, but we're going to focus today just for a brief moment on the autonomic part of that nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is automatic. So I want you to think that, um, think about it like this part of your nervous system is very primal and it's run by your emotions. And it doesn't need your consciousness at all, at all. It's constantly looking internal, external environment to see how it can protect you. And there's two main gears. If it feels like you're going to be in danger, it's going to create a marauder of responses in your body 
called a sympathetic response. And that response puts you into fight or flight. So pretty much anytime we get stressed in whatever form the stress comes on whatever layer, we're gonna go into this state. The parasympathetic response is just like this guy, just chilling, um, rest and digest. It sets us up so we can go into those places and those spaces. Um, and what we really just wanna take away from this slide is this is always happening. It does not require our consciousness, but when we become more conscious about how this is happening and if it's happening chronically, we can do things to better serve, um, serve our bodies and ourselves. Polyvagal theory, if you've never heard of it, it was a theory that was created by a gentleman by the name of Stephen Porges back in the 90s. And this theory, um, this theory basically says that that part of our nervous system, the autonomic, it's always scanning the inside and scanning the outside environment in our bodies, everything outside of our bodies. And then it kind of triggers one of three gears to be set off. Now, the thing about these three different gears is depending on which, which gear gets set off, the physiological responses are going to set us up for different types of emotions and feelings and experiences. One of the gears is called ventral vagal pathway. And in this particular gear, this is like ideal. Green for go. Like if we could be in ventral vagal all the time, oh my gosh, this is when we feel the most connected, the most regulated, content. Um, we're in a space where we can learn, we can problem solve, we are breathing slow, uh, I'm sorry, deep, but the heart rate is slow. We'll be able to, we're able to communicate well. We're not taken over by an alarm within the nervous system that's saying danger. And that's the middle one. And that's that sympathetic nervous response, the fight or flight. It's that hyper arousal. It's, it's pretty much the physiology shifting in our body, getting us ready to be mobile. Everything so it's easier for us to either get up and go or run for our lives. Now, the thing is, is all of those responses that our body has, it sets us up also to feel things like panic, rage, anger, we might get judgmental, blaming, and attacking. So when we're in a sympathetic response, you can see how it would be useful to know that you're in, the in that space, one, so that you have a higher level of awareness of how you might be re um, reacting, actually, to whatever's happening around you. And then maybe you're able to make a different choice, resource yourself, and make a different response. And respond rather than be reactive, right? Now the, the red one, life threatening. So this is literally when we think we're going to die. Dorsal vagal pathway. You don't have to remember the fancy words, just remember life threatening. This is when the parasympathetic, usually it's the sympathetic that kicks off to protect us. But at some point, the parasympathetic system kicks in fully and puts you into something called freeze. So it's when you feel threatened, when your sympathetic response is like, you know what, even though I'm fully mobilized, I really, I really still feel vulnerable. I'm not gonna make it, I actually might die. It's a complete survival state. And that complete survival state actually immobilizes you. It can actually create a container inside of your body to experience feelings like hopelessness, depression, shame. And you can go a lot into a disassociated state. Um, this is actually very, very common. In fact, right now with all the havoc that's happening in the environment and the collective, I see it a lot. Um, I see it in the collective. I see it in my clients. This, this disassociation that takes place because life feels really, really threatened, shut down or freeze. So he talks about these three different gears. I, what I really want you to walk away here with is that our body will be kind of like the alarm. When we start to feel our heartbeat 
increase. And when we can tell that we're getting hyper aroused, then we know that we're going into the danger zone. And if we get to that point where we think we're like going to die, I mean, it's not literal, literal physical death. It's actually like so overwhelming. It could have that same level of intensity. Then we might shift into the more of this frozen state. And you might just reflect at times in your life when you've either been really mobilized and activated, or maybe you went into a freeze state, a disassociated state, and you couldn't understand why. So it's good to map the nervous system. Now, back to those three gears, ventral vagal in that green one, right? That first one, the world is safe and I am connected. Just a way to simplify it. In the sympathetic fight or flight, the world is fight or flight and I am mobilized. And in the dorsal vagal state where life is threatened, the world is numb collapsed and I am immobilized. Now, when, if you forget all that, that's okay too. <laughs> Everything that we just went over, there's no test. Here's what's important, okay? Our vagal tone, it refers to our, the strength and the speed and the efficiency of the vagus nerve. Now the vagus nerve is, if you look to the image on the right, it goes all the way down from the back of our neck, all the way down into our guts. So you could consider it um, kind of like the connector between the, the gut and the brain. Its job is to reset the immune system and to switch off the production of inflammation. So it's an incredibly important highway and it runs through the length of your body. In fact, sometimes it's called the wanderer or the traveler. It's becoming clear through the research that by stimulating our vagus nerve, we can improve our vagal tone. And when we can improve our vagal tone, we have the ability, the variability of our heart rate when we go from like a, a danger zone or to a threat, life-threatening zone or to a happy zone, um, the, the ability for us to oscillate back and forth through these three gears becomes a lot more efficient and optimal. So when we improve vagal tone, we can really enhance and enrich our physical and mental states, improving everything from our lifespan. And it's also called, I thought this was really interesting, it's called the self-care nerve. And it really is also being called the future of medicine. So it can really hold a key for a lot of people in finding a way to better manage their moods and themselves as they navigate through the different stressors of life. So now that we are kind of connected to the realm of stress in a little bit of a different way, um, let's look at the question of what is self-care? And what are types of self-care? Because I want you to even just think to yourself for a moment. When I ask you, like, what is self-care? You might notice that there's a lot of subjective answers that might arise. Or maybe there's some ones that you've heard out in the world. Like maybe you've heard, you know, when I can go on vacation, that's when I'm doing self-care. Or when I can get a manicure and pedicure. Or when I can go to the spa. Or when I can go to the gym. Or when I can go to the beach. Or when I can take that time um, to do something that just really helps me get back into alignment, whatever that is, right? So there's different, remember those circles in the, in the beginning where we were going over those circles of the layers that make up our being? They're kind of here again, but in a little bit of a different way. Physical, emotional, social, and spiritual. So I recommend that when you think of self-care, you don't just think about it as um, a vacation or you know, buying yourself something new, but that you also start to think about it from the perspective of, wow, if I'm constantly taking in all of this stress and it's coming in on every layer of my being, how am I integrating some type of methodology of self-care into my daily life? So self-care becomes a part of 
lifestyle rather than this thing that you have to really plan hard for. And sometimes it's hard to make happen. So going down the categories, um, I always encourage people to have a pen and paper or you know, something that you can type on and really go through your own process of inquiry while we're going through. Thinking just like, okay, what are different types of self-care physically that I can do? Maybe it's making sure that you're getting enough sleep. Maybe it's getting up and just taking a few stretches, doing the six basic movements of the spine, walking, or some type of physical release. A lot of us, you know, it's really important to get that physical release. For some of us, something intense physically is not what we need. We need more rest. We need more meditation. We need, need more um, relaxing, right? And then, of course, another physical thing would be, what are we feeding our bodies, right? The food that we take in, the body is converting into energy and vitality. Are we giving it something healthy to work with? Another physical act of self-care would be yoga. Of course, I'm a big advocate of that because as a yoga therapist and as a therapist, I see the power that yoga um, has an impact on, in people's lives. And then rest, right? Some of us don't get enough sleep, right? And if we're not getting enough sleep, we did a whole sleep series. You can dial back into that one and see the type of stress that that can and havoc that can create in our body. So we need to consider every part, every piece. And then there's emotionally, right? So even if you're taking care of your body, you have an emotional body. You have a heart that needs to be tended to. And the stress that can come through with the different volumes of emotions that we might experience, just like ocean waves, right? Some days the waves are mellow and soft and other days, whoo, you don't wanna be out in those waves, right? So emotions have a similar quality. Um, and so the types of self-care in the umbrella of emotions is comes with stress management because when we start to stack stress in the body, our ability um, to our window of tolerance for certain things gets shorter, and then it becomes a little easier to go into a primal response of emoting in a way that's not serving us. So practicing ways to develop our own emotional maturity. Even in the yoga practices, one of the things that we're doing a lot of is we are expanding our awareness and that gives us more capacity emotionally. Also being able to connect to things like forgiveness, compassion, kindness, love, um, and coming from that place of connection to all living things. So that is the emotional bucket. And then of course we are social beings that love to connect with each other. So we've also got to check in with our relationships, right? And look at our social worlds and just see like, okay, are the boundaries healthy? That's self-care. I love the, the, the uh, self-care tip of just say no or ask for help. Sometimes we don't do these things, right? And it's really an act of self-love to do these things. So checking in with our boundaries, making sure that we have systems of support where we need them, making sure that if we are engaging in social media or in the news, that there's some positivity coming in and we're not just taking in negativity. Um, making sure that we have ways to express ourselves and to be heard making sure we have time with the people that matter the most to us. And I hope you're, you consider yourself one of the ones that matter the most to you. And then also, you know, it's that connection of feeling being, feeling supported. So being willing to ask for help from the people in your life. And then spiritual self-care is really an inner dive, right? It's taking that time to go inward, whether it's through a yoga practice, meditation, or connecting to nature, because we are nature. We're all the same elements of nature. So when we go outside and we connect to her, we're connecting to ourselves. Also from a spiritual place, you know, maybe um, journaling, taking that time to put pen to paper for self-reflection, and then sacred space, meaning that you have a space somewhere that you can go. And when you're there and you know that that's your space, it could be an altar, 
that maybe you just put in your, um, in your living space or, you know, um, just a place maybe in nature even, right? It doesn't have to be in your house that feels sacred to you. So when I say sacred, what I mean is just really important, something that allows you to really open up your heart and really um, connect to yourself deeper. And then some of the other ideas are just like, you know, taking a step back sometimes, taking a step back and not having to be in a hurry, forgiving yourself or making yourself first. As I said, saying no, we're asking for help, going inward a little more respite and spending more time at home. Although a lot of us have been probably been doing a lot of that. And then setting boundaries and really being willing to ask for what we need. So goals of self-care really, if you haven't caught on to it yet, are what is our stress management plan? Sometimes it's nice to get out of town and get the heck out of Dodge and, and go on a vacation, whether it's local or international or wherever we can go, right? And then sometimes it's not possible, right? So we got to find our stress management plan, the one that's going to work for us so that we can set up these containers for thriving and not just surviving. And so for yourself, you might ask yourself, what are those things that would really make a difference that maybe I'm not doing right now? And then I'm gonna give you some suggestions on how to activate your vagus nerve because we talked about the vagus nerve and we know the value in activating it. It's gonna help us manage our stress. So reflexology, so to the right, you see there's vagus nerve points on your feet. You can actually just sit down and give yourself a little massage and work with those points. You can just get on Google. It's pretty easy to find these. Meditation is gonna help massage your vagus nerve. Breath work. And we're gonna do a little exercise before we uh, end today that'll show us how we can use our vo vocal cords because the the pathway of ventral vagal runs across the, the neck and the mouth. And so when we activate those parts of our physiology, it helps us calm the body. Cold therapy also helps calm the body. Yoga, tapping, all different types of breathing techniques, like I said, we're going to do in today. Probiotics, prayer, and even fasting is another way that we can manage our stress. So today, this is one of my favorite breaths because you can literally feel yourself vibrating from the inside. So I'm going to invite you guys um, to try it out with me, but I want to first share with you that, you know, it's, it's really interesting that this B breath is what we call it. It's one of the most stimulating ways to um, get to that ner vagus nerve. And it's the humming, that rhythmic chanting that hummingbirds have been doing for so long. Um, but just chanting in general and yoga also, it helps with the vagus nerve. So um, what I'd like you to do is you're going to choose. If you're not comfortable taking your fingers to your ears, um, if you're using your fingers to your ears and you want to do what she's doing on the slide with your hands, you'll take the thumbs to the ears. You'll place your pinkies on the outer lips the ring fingers underneath your nostrils, the next finger right over your eyelids, and the, the pointer finger right on top of your eyebrows. And we're just gonna take a breath in, and when we breathe out, we're gonna hum. Inhale. Take a breath. We're going to do it two more times. Inhale. Mm -hmm. One more. Deep breath in. Mm -hmm. Go 
ahead and release your arms down. And just take a moment to notice how it feels in your body, how it felt to have that vibrating sensation throughout your body. It's very, very calming. Um, so just a little tool that you can use when you're out in the real world. And also if you like to sing or chant, that is another powerful um, activity you can do. Another way is to work with your breath. I always talk about the breath. Ujjayi breathing is when we breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. So you might just even experience that right now, maybe sealing your lips and breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Just start to notice that. See if you can constrict the back of your throat. It's the gloteus. And what happens is the breath begins to sound a little bit like the ocean. So it's And so from here, we're just going to explore a three-part breath. So inhale into the upper part of your lungs. Exhale out the upper part of your lungs. Inhale into the middle part of your lungs. Exhale out the middle part of your lungs. And this time, inhale all the way into the belly. Feel your belly expand. Exhale, empty all the way out of the belly. So now we're going to inhale into the belly, into the ribs, into the chest. And exhale, let the breath completely go. So you can work with those types of breathings, whichever one best speaks to you in the moment, right? Either bringing the breath up here, mostly if you want to create energy, I would work with upper chest breathing. Then going into the middle, noticing what it feels like to breathe into the middle part of your lungs. And then the lower part of your lungs or the three part, uh, lower, middle, upper is really one of my favorites. And you wanna try to do a count of maybe three to four on your breath in and on your breath out. Also, you could just simply Breathe and imagine in your mind's eye that as you breathe in at point one, the breath is coming up the back side all the way to a count of three to your third eye. And then on the exhale, sending the breath down the front side of the body for a count of three. And then sending the breath up the back side of the body with your mind's eye to your mind's eye. Sending the breath out, feeling it releasing out your pelvis, all out your coax. Take one more round. Feel the breath climbing up the back side of the body to the mind's eye. And feel the breath out, emptying, 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 emptying. Beautiful. And come back to your normal breathing. So these um, are just a few little takeaways for today. Next session, we're gonna get into how does stress impact the body and how does it impact our sleep? So as we move into self-care, we're gonna be using that lens that we use today of how the stress is coming into the different layers that make up our being, the ways that we might be able to tend to those different layers and by the fourth session, we will develop our own self-care plan. The third session will be how do we manage our own energetic bodies. So I hope that you're able to join us for these next few sessions. Um, my name is Lisa, and um, I work with uh, yoga and depth psychology as a way to support people in their own transformational processes. And I give Access Elite members a discounted rate for being members. And uh, Jesse will let you know how you can dial that in if you're interested. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thanks everybody for joining us. If you love today's session, you can sign up for her next one either on the mobile app or through accesslatenow.com. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly at jromine at accesslatenow.com. Thanks again, Lisa. Looking forward to the next three sessions.
You too.